Well, today we're with um, Dr. Steve Rondano Prediger. And Steve, it's been a joy to have you this week. Great to um, be here. As our Grenz Lectureship Series. Steve is the Professor of Religion and Director of Environmental Studies Program, and Associate Dean for Teaching and Learning at Hope College in Michigan. Um, Steve, we've had a great weekend, been talking really, I love this topic of um, ecological homelessness. And so we'll talk a bit about that. But before we do that, I'd love to hear a little bit more of your story. Um, we here at the school believe in the power of the story. And I was wondering, as a child or as an adult, and I don't think I've ever heard this story from no, you. No, I don't think you have. What has caused you or what has shaped your love of the earth? That's a great question. Um, as a kid, I was fortunate enough to grow up mostly in working class uh, industrial town of Muskegon, Michigan, where my family moved when I was in elementary school. Fortunate enough to grow up with some woods in the background, of the house. We lived, you know, as a middle class family. My father was a guidance counselor at a high school. My mother was a secretary. But we, uh, the house we lived in right behind us was, I don't know, maybe 10 or 12 acres of uh, mm. meadows and mm. woods. So mm -hmm. many fond memories as a kid, elementary school age, of just wandering around on summer days, mm. building forts underground with my, you know, boyfriends and friends mm -hmm. in the neighborhood mm -hmm. and playing hide and go seek and tag and I remember we built my brother and I older brother built a like a 50 yard long football field mm -hmm. in the property just uh, behind our yard mm -hmm. and we had uh, I think it was a six hole mini golf course <laughs> that we constructed you know mm -hmm. three times around or 18 holes and and so it was just building tree forts and so you know, I didn't, it wasn't as if my parents were, you know, teaching me how to be a birder or anything like that. It was just, though, memories of a lot of time year-round, really, in the winter as well, uh, spending time outdoors. Mm -hmm. And I probably, in high school, I couldn't have named, you know, a dozen birds or even 10 or 12 trees, but I had a kind of tactile, mm -hmm. uh, embodied sense. So I, I knew what a white pine looked like and mm -hmm. smelled like and felt like. Mm -hmm and and oaks and so on so um and then we took occasionally because my my parents were on a kind of academic schedule working in k-12 through schools uh, summers we often spent two three weeks at a time on a family vacation initially tent camping mm -hmm. and then i think my mom had enough of that and then it was a pop top camper you know, pulled behind whatever vehicle we were driving at the time. It had to go for more convenience. Then. Yes, and, and then it was a, a little trailer that mm. we would rent. We never owned any of these, We would, mm. except the tent, but that we would rent them from, you know, local people, and we would go east or west, or, I, you know, memories of going to national parks out west and, and historical Mount Gettysburg, places like that out east. And we'd be gone for, you know, two or three weeks at a time. My dad would teach driver's training mm. for June and part of July, and then we'd take two or three week family mm. vacation. Mm. So that was, uh, again, it, it wasn't as if I was uh, intentionally being part of, of mm. some sort of family mm. eco-literacy project. Right. It was just getting to know another, you know, other parts of the country mm. and, you know, have firsthand experience of looking down at the Grand Canyon or mm. up at giant sequoia trees or mm. Um, yeah, hiking, day hiking, you know, nothing fancy and extensive, but uh, that was a, I think that was mostly junior high and high school, a kind of formative experience. Mm. The biggest thing, though, was, um, would have been the summer before my senior year in college, uh, I applied for and was accepted to be a camp counselor okay. at a denominational uh, summer camp. The Reformed Church in America, Protestant denomination, had, I think, six or seven camps all over Iowa to New Jersey, and there was one in Illinois, it was actually South Suburban uh, Chicago, near the town of Frankfurt, mm -hmm. Illinois. And the director at the time, a wild and crazy guy by the name of Paul Ransford, and he started, in addition to the resident camp program where kids would come like a normal summer camp, you know, and there'd be a pool and games and so on, he started uh, an out camp program of canoeing and backpacking, mm -hmm. two or three weeks during the summer. And for some strange reason, he asked me and another female uh, camp counselor, Heidi Perez, 
uh, to you lead. You remember the names, too. Yeah, I do. Well, uh, <laughs> Selene was a camp counselor, uh-huh. my wife. Uh-huh. We, weren't, we weren't married at the time, of course, but she had been a counselor the, the year before, and that's how I found out about this camp. Oh, okay. Applied, and then we both were camp counselors, but Paul Ransford asked mm-hmm. me and Heidi to be the co-leaders of this canoeing trip mm-hmm. to this wild and crazy place called the Boundary Waters Canoeary Wilderness, mm-hmm. which in 1978, that was the first, very first summer that it was actually a wilderness area. It had been the, the roadless area for decades up in northern northeastern Minnesota, but it had just gained status as an official wilderness area. One million acres in Superior National por- Forest, 120 mile long border with Quetico Provincial Park on the Canadian side. So you had two million acres of wilderness area. And um, I led that trip. It was the summer before my senior year. My athletic career was soon ending. I played football. I knew I had one more year to go. You don't do that the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. And and I just fell in love with that place. Mm-hmm. And I became came to realize fairly quickly that this is something, canoeing, mm-hmm. I could do the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. And uh, that started a, a great interest in educating myself about um, about backpacking, canoeing, mm-hmm rock climbing, all that sort of stuff. So the day after I graduated from college, I went out uh, to New Hampshire mm-hmm. with a Christian organization, kind of Christian outward bound group, mm-hmm. and I learned how to rock climb mm-hmm. and backpack. I did another seminar a couple years later with Wheaton College mm-hmm. up at their um, Honey Rock Camp in northern mm-hmm. Wisconsin. I know Honey Rock. Yeah, mm-hmm. and uh, that was kind of an instructor leadership training course modeled after, again, like outward bound. Mm-hmm. We had a three-day solo uh, no food, you fasted for three days, all by yourself on the shore of Lake Superior in the Upper Peninsula. Anyway, it included canoeing and backpacking. So in 1980, I helped with uh, helped start an organization called Wilderness Adventures, which was run through the Reformed Church in America, the churches in the Upper Midwest. A gentleman there who was running their youth ministry program started seeing how kids who were coming up in churches would go to local camps in Michigan, Wisconsin, Illinois, and by the time they got to be in high school, they, they were sort of camped out. Mm. They'd seen it all, and, they, and the tenants started dropping, and so he had this idea of having kind of alternative camp program run through the denomination, but it would be backpacking, canoeing, mm. whitewater rafting, rock climbing, whatever, and hired me to help start it. So in 1980, uh, with a Calvin grad, no less, a woman who gra- recently graduated from Calvin, I graduated from Hope, we uh, started this program called Wilderness Adventures, and the following year, I hired Kent Bushman, who's now 30-year camp director at Camp Fowler in upstate New York, and my wife, uh, plus the woman who was hired the first year, the four of us, we basically doubled our capacity, and we're running uh, two trips simultaneously, and they were 10-day long trips. Uh, the Boundary Waters of northeastern Minnesota, we'd canoe or hand rock climb the Rockies, Rocky Mountain National Park, just north and south. We'd backpack and rock climb uh, the Nantahala National Forest, south of Great Smoky Mountain National Park in far western North Carolina. Mm-hmm. We would uh, hike the Appalachian Trail, backpack, and then uh, whitewater raft of various rivers down there and also rock climb in North Georgia. Mm-hmm. And we had bicycle trips in Michigan and Wisconsin, canoeing, backpacking, combined trips in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. So I did that for four years, four summers. Mm-hmm. During the school year, I was in uh, graduate school in Toronto, mostly in those years. Um, and then when my wife and I, Ms. Lane and I, decided to go to uh, Fuller Seminary in 1983, then we passed the baton off to Kent and his wife, whom he met on a wilderness trip that he was leading. Okay. So there's, a, there's a theme here. Yeah, so all that to say is there, were, in my early to mid-20s, I was leading wilderness mm-hmm. trips professionally mm-hmm. in conjunction with his mm-hmm. denomination. Mm-hmm. And then moving to California was like, I thought I died and gone to heaven because mm-hmm. there were all these great places to go hiking and rock climbing. Joshua Tree we spent a lot of time there and uh, hiking in the in the Southern Sierra. Mm-hmm. So that yeah. was it was a combination of things, mm-hmm. you know. And again, I, I sort of I, I was not a biology or geology major in college. Mm-hmm. I learned a lot of this from reading lots of books mm-hmm. and from doing seminars mm-hmm. like the ones I mentioned, fifteen, twenty day leadership training seminars. Mm-hmm where you're learning not just certain skills, but you're learning how to lead groups mm-hmm. 
you get cert- and then you get um, you know uh, certified for um, first aid and all that mm-hmm. kind of stuff and reading books about leadership mm-hmm. and leadership for wilderness trip leading. So well, that- well, one of the things I hear too is the the relational connection that people and wilderness go together. Yeah, exactly. And um, the sense that I developed a love for this both the introduction to and there's a quality, a sense of awe that happened at the Boundary Waters. Yes. And, and yeah. a sense of, uh, I discovered parts of me there and what I could do on into my future. Yeah, um, Comes right. through. And then there's relationships. Uh, we've known each other for a long time. And I think I've always had a bit of, um, I think I mentioned this before, envy. As I hear you taking your daughters off to the Boundary Lands. Yeah. I mean, and they, it was such a big family piece yeah. with you. Yeah, it was. And um, the specialness of that and the quality of relation, relating time mm-hmm. they have with you. So I've probably pictured you not, not just in the wilderness by yourself, you know, right. but it's with people. Yeah. And so one of the things that stands out for me, the sense of wilderness yeah. and you with people. And the girls were eight, five, and three. We took them on a canoe trip for a week. They were actually in the Boundary Waters twice, each of them before that when they were little. Cara was four months old, I had her in a snuggly paddling uh-huh. up there, but we stayed in a cabin rather than doing a trip. Uh-huh. But when they were eight, five, and three, we, we rented a 18 and a half foot long canoe, all five of us in one canoe wow. for a whole week. Wow. No distractions, <laughs> just the kids. We repeated that mm-hmm. when they were 15, 13, and 10. Mm-hmm. And then when each of the girls turned 12 or 13, I took them on a father-daughter mm-hmm. canoe trip to the mm-hmm. Boundary Water. So each of them has been there seven times wow. over the years, either through mm-hmm. family trips of various sorts. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. No, that help. That helps you know, both fill out the sense, because I've experienced your um, your your scholarly interest, but I've also experienced the, the relational the love of it. Yeah. I and mean, that's probably the, the question. Um, I want to ask you about this notion of ecological homelessness, which I, this this theme of home again feels very relational and connected. Mm-hmm. And as you talk about ecological homelessness, what is that? What does that mean for you, and um, what are you wanting us to hear? Yeah, it's a great question because it's a bit of a neologism. Uh, most people, when they hear the word homeless or homelessness, they think about you know street people and a kind of socioeconomic homelessness. But in the late 90s, I was doing research for a conference paper, as was my friend Brian Walsh, who we knew each other from Toronto days in the 80s, 1980s. And we realized uh, we were both on to sort of the same thing picking up uh, different kinds of homelessness beyond merely the, the typical uh, notion of homelessness. And for me, reading a lot in environmental studies, um, I ran across, the striking thing, I ran across a quote from a philosopher in Australia who, who said, we're feeling homeless in our own homeland because of global climate change. Mm-hmm. And this was 25 years ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, that struck me because a lot of the other literature I'd been reading was they weren't using that language, mm-hmm. but that's that's the gist of what was happening. Mm-hmm. People who weren't feeling homeless because they moved somewhere else, they were feeling homeless because the place they knew as home mm-hmm. was changing, mm-hmm. ecologically speaking. Mm-hmm. So again, the irony of feeling homeless in your homeland. So we coined the term, Brian and I, in working on a book that became the book Beyond Homelessness, we coined the term ecological homelessness to describe this sense of feeling not at home in your own place. Mm -hmm. And part of the book, in chapter two, we kind of do a phenomenology of what is a home, what Mm -hmm. constitutes a home, and what are different forms of displacement. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, migrant, immigrant, exile, um, well-housed homeless was a category Mm -hmm. I came up with after uh, spending time with some people who were hosting me for a speaking engagement in, uh, in Texas, actually. And a woman who at dinner commented in this beautiful home with I don't know how many bedrooms and bathrooms said she felt homeless. Mm. And she wasn't living on the street or in a ravine right. somewhere. Right. You know, it, but she felt homeless even in her own mm. uh, very wealthy home. Mm. Mm-hmm. So we developed these categories of displacement and also then did a kind of phenomenology of home. What, what does it mean to be at home? Well, it's affiliation. It's a sense of embeddedness and being a resident, an inhabitant in a place and knowing that place. It, it uh, has to do with um, yeah, knowing not just people, but what's, you know, what's going right, on right. in your place. It. It's being safe, a mm-hmm. safe resting place. Mm-hmm. So we come up with, I think, eight or nine 
different sort of characteristics of home. And if you sort of map that on to what people are saying in terms of ecological homelessness, I mean, you, you start to see that they're in their home, quote unquote, but they're not feeling safe. They're not feeling connected mm -hmm. to other people. They, mm -hmm. They're losing their sense of knowing what that mm -hmm. place is like. Mm -hmm. So um, those two chapters, the middle chapters in the book Beyond Homelessness are sort of a diagnosis and prescription on ecological homelessness. Why are people, what, is it, what does that mean and why are people feeling that way? Mm -hmm. And then what resources does the Christian tradition have, mm -hmm. particularly scripture, mm -hmm. to address this growing sense of ecological mm -hmm. homelessness? Mm -hmm. It's interesting, we've been, you know, at least I've been having conversations about social fragmentation for the same sense. That's saying that it doesn't mean people are absent, but you don't feel connected to them. Right. You don't feel connected in the same sense of not just simply not being connected to people, but not being connected to place right. and nature and, in essence, probably ourselves. Right? Yeah. A sense of disconnect. Right. Um, as we talk about or think about the sort of devastation, um, ecological devastation that is you know, expressed in this notion of homelessness. What do you see us facing in the next, this generation? Yeah, that's a, that's a question on everyone's mind when you start thinking about these things. Um, chapter two in my book, For the Beauty of the Earth, I look at 10 different ecological degradations, and, and so it's, it can be pretty depressing. Uh, we were facing some huge issues, the most famous or infamous, most well-known one, of course, is probably global climate change. Um, in part because it's global, unlike uh, other problems, which may be you know, a toxic waste site in a particular mm -hmm. place, which mm -hmm. seems much more fixable mm -hmm. because it's local. Mm -hmm. um, and because uh, global climate change affects um, almost every other environmental and many social uh, problems and issues. But the loss of biodiversity, it's, it's the one metaphor is used, it's like we're unraveling the 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 web, uh, three species a day going extinct, and that's that's simply not sustainable. Um, water, both quality and um, quantity, you know, California, five years now, lower than expected snow in the Sierra Nevada, so there's a, a drought going in California. Um, some places there may be more water, the predictions are of global climate change science, others there'll be less water. Um, and is, if there is enough water in many places in the world, especially in very impoverished areas, there may be enough water, but it's not potable, it's not drinkable. It's contaminated for whatever reason. So you may have enough, but it's, you, know, you don't want to drink it. So and, and we need water, clean air. Those are all you know, absolutely essential uh, to human life. So uh, there are a lot of degradations, and in many cases, they're going in the wrong direction, as to say things are getting worse. It's not entirely the case. I mentioned um, I mentioned the book and elsewhere. You know, the Endangered Species Act of 1973 has had a real positive impact. Air quality has improved in a number of places, not least Los Angeles, mm -hmm. compared to 30 years ago. Lake Erie doesn't catch on fire anymore like it did. Famous headlines, you know, in 1973 or 74, whenever that was. So there's been some real progress. It's a mixed bag, but there are enough serious ecological degradations that um, if business as usual, which is the term that Jim Hansen uses, he's one of the leading American climate scientists, if, if that happens, um, we're going to have some very serious hmm. problems, especially 20, 30 years from now. We're not look, talking 90 years from now. We're hmm. looking a couple of decades. And many people would say we're already seeing significant yeah. changes. Wow. Wow. Um, and you don't have to wait to the future. The future is happening now, especially with respect to climate change. Mm. It's important to say, though, it's not, I mean, business as usual is not a fait accompli. Mm -hmm. There are some real things that we can and should do mm -hmm. to mitigate this. We're above 400 parts per million CO2 from the global climate perspective, which was sort of the, the goal 10, 15 years ago. You know, we don't want to get above that, but which is why Bill McKibben's organization is 350 org 350 uh, signifies 350 parts per million. That's what we got to get back to, mm. to have a planet that we're used to. Mm. Wow. Uh, so there are significant environmental challenges, but uh, contrary, to, I think, to what many people think, um, 
there's also an opportunity to make some real changes. Mm -hmm. The Paris Accord, most recently, was a huge deal breaker, mm -hmm. in part because two of the lead, well, the two leading countries that produce a majority of uh, the uh, CO2, China and the United States, prior to the Paris Accord, had a, had a bilateral agreement, okay. right, to say we are voluntarily going to set these goals and we're going to enforce each other mm -hmm. and we're going to make some positive change to decrease CO2 uh, outputs. And then that, that move, rather bold move, then set the tone for Paris. Mm -hmm. Now everyone says, well, who's going to hold who accountable here? And that remains to be seen. But the Paris Accord could, 20 years from now, we could be looking back at that the way we look back at the 1987 Montreal Protocol about mm -hmm. chlorofluorocarbons in the ozone layer. Mm -hmm. A huge success. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of nations signing on mm -hmm. because some scientists, within 10 years, some scientists saw that the you know, ozone high up in the atmosphere is being depleted by chlorofluorocarbons. And so those were sort of uh, legislation through the UN, those were done away with. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's a there's a story of hope there, of and international maybe, collaboration on I'll, a huge problem. Maybe I'll follow up and maybe just nudge you in that direction, um, because I think this is the challenging piece, hope. Uh, it's easy to feel overwhelmed. It's right. easy then to <clears throat> try to either ignore or um, deny. But what are the images of hope that you have seen? Well, yeah, I mentioned the Montreal Protocol. That's one that many people um, mentioned. For me, I mean, those are that's all well and good. We need that. But for me, it's seeing progress at the local level. Um, wherever I go, um, in the town of Holland, Michigan, where I live in southwestern Michigan, Project Clarity, we've raised $15 million to help clean up our watershed. And it's a collaborative thing involving multiple organizations, including the college where I Teach Hope College, but also some nonprofits, um, wealthy philanthropists in the community who've contributed money, school districts. It's it's sort of this multi-pronged effort to clean up the mess that previous generations made of the local watershed, and that's just one example I know of. There are multiple examples of things like that going on um, in lots of other places. Um, educational efforts are increasing. We've got a couple examples again locally that I know well through the Outdoor Discovery Center, or Little Hawks Preschool. We've got a, a wait list of, I don't know, a couple hundred families trying to get their kids into this, is, this uh, environmentally oriented preschool. And then one of the local school districts have um, stream school for middle school kids. And all your work, you do English, you know, you do writing, you do history, you do science, all project-based learning out in the outdoors. So, and, and we're getting from the, what I hear from the director, Travis Williams, lots of interest from people who've heard about this, mm -hmm. and they want to replicate it mm -hmm. where they are, mm -hmm. not just in Michigan, but you know around the country. Mm -hmm. So I think there are a lot of signs of hope like that, of mm -hmm. people who, who are resisting this sense of being um, dispower or, or um, lack of empowerment mm -hmm. because they feel that the problems are so large, so intractable, mm -hmm. what can little old me do? Mm -hmm. And they're saying that may be that may be true. These are big problems. These are wicked problems. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, I can do this in my community, mm -hmm. and that empowers them because they can then see the change for good that's mm -hmm. happening wherever they happen to be. Mm -hmm. And um, so, another example: look what's happened to coal just in the last two or three years. The coal plant where I live is being shut down. Peabody Coal, the largest coal company in this country, I think in the world, just declared bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, for a whole host of factors, some systemic, but mm -hmm. also, you know, a lot of little people doing a lot of little things. Mm -hmm. And who would have thought 10 years ago mm -hmm. that the coal industry would be going belly up? Mm -hmm. Many people are saying eventually if the fracking thing stops, the uh, same thing's going to happen with natural gas. So then we only have one fossil fuel left, that's right. oil. And then you look at, you know, Toyota Prius hybrid, you know, and, and all the technology there. So, mm -hmm. yes, there's... There's uh, a lot of room to be concerned about various environmental problems, but there, there are also a lot of really cool stories of hope that are percolating up all over the world, many of which are not being, it's not top down. It's not always countries, nation states, provinces, you know, saying you must do this, but percolating up from, from below. People who are entrepreneurs 
are just doing what they think the right thing is. It's helpful to hear. Um, and uh, for those of us who at times feel like we're entering into this conversation late, it's helpful to hear that there's others. Um, thank you, one, for being here, and thank you for being a pioneer. Um, thank you. For trailblazing and also holding out a light of hope. It's good to have you and good to have you, good friend. Great. And thank you for blessing us. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.